At the beginning of 1917, the Russian Empire is still governed by an all-powerful Tsar. From his palace in St. Petersburg, one man, answerable only to God, rules over 170 million people. Nicholas II holds more power than any other monarch in Europe. He has resisted political change. But the Tsar's days are numbered. Discontented, hungry workers go on strike in St. Petersburg. Russia has been fighting in the First World War for nearly three years, and the Tsar's huge armies have become demoralized and disaffected. They've suffered defeat after defeat. Two million have died. In February 1917, there is a great upheaval. A provisional government takes over. The Tsar abdicates and is arrested. What happens next will change the course of history. Russians believed they had won their freedom at last. In the euphoria, soldiers whose mutiny had helped bring down the Tsar celebrated with workers. Most people expected democracy, elections, and an assembly to steer the country. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, leader of the small Bolshevik party, wanted more revolutionary change. A state run by and for the working class, a dictatorship of the proletariat. First, he built up popular support by promising to end the war, give land to the peasants, and power to the workers. Then, in October, the Bolsheviks were ready to seize power. Among Lenin's supporters was a young poet, Alexander Bryansky. Take to the streets, rise up, raise your hammer, forge happiness for the world, end the bowing and scraping, go boldly, shine, rejoice. On October 25th, 1917, the Bolsheviks moved on the Winter Palace, where the provisional government was based. Bryansky was with them. On Lenin's advice, the sailors put on the uniforms of Winter Palace employees. They worked their way into the building through back entrances, attics and roofs. On a warship behind the Winter Palace, Bolshevik sailors waited to give a signal for the final stages of the coup. When the aurora fired, everyone rushed forward, shouting hurrah. We climbed over the gates and broke into the Winter Palace. I was at the front. I ran up the stairs and stumbled into a big hall where there was a whole detachment of officer cadets with their rifles at the ready. I shouted, throw down your rifles. And they threw down their weapons as if to order. They'd seen how angry we were. The taking of the Winter Palace was reconstructed on film by the revolutionary's own director, Sergei Eisenstein in a highly dramatized version.
In reality, there was little resistance. Only five were killed. But the film version helped establish a key myth for the revolution, a heroic story of how the workers seized power. That same night, Lenin spoke to the workers' revolutionary councils, the Soviets, setting out his vision. He told them Russia had turned a new page, leading to the victory of socialism. From now on, he said, the oppressed masses will themselves form the government. Outside the hall, many were frightened by what the Bolsheviks might do. But the early believers were excited by Lenin's message and full of hope. I thought that the future of Russia would take a different path, that the people would exercise power through the workers and soldiers and Soviets. Everyone would work wherever they were, free from exploitation. What I liked was the promise of a happy, classless society in the future, in which everyone would enjoy all the good created by the society. I was attracted by the idea of justice, equality between people, acting in the name of humanity. Soon after the revolution, the Bolsheviks became known as the Russian Communist Party and moved the capital from St. Petersburg to Moscow. They took Russia out of the war in Europe. The Tsar and his family were executed. And from Moscow, they planned to extend the revolution to the rest of the world. A forceful message was sent to workers everywhere. If the proletariat in other countries followed the communist way, they could kick out kings and capitalists and achieve a world free of exploitation and war. Harry Young went to Moscow in a delegation from the tiny British Communist Party. And Zinoviev, who was the chairman, said the next speaker will be Comrade Lenin. He'd have been drunk. Dead silence, vast hall, 3,000 people from all over the world. And a little man, or not much bigger than me, broader shouldered with rather Mongolian looking face, very bald head, little, little whiskers there. And he got up and he, um, he just leaned over the, like a podium, you know, it was his corner, like that. And he just, uh, Talk to him like a Dutch uncle. I thought he had uh, set the scene for the world revolution and that uh, the, the Bolshevik party would successfully lead it, that next, next would be f uh, Germany, then France, then Italy. In the ferment after the First World War, others tried to follow the Bolshevik example. In Berlin, communists tried to seize power. In Munich, they succeeded briefly. In Hungary, a Soviet republic lasted several months. But the successes were short-lived communist uprising was crushed. And back in Russia, the communists had to fight for their own survival in a vicious civil war against supporters of the old regime. By 1921, the communists were victorious. But the party that claimed to speak for the people had never had majority support. Lenin had created a large secret police force to kill and terrorize his opponents.
after the Civil War, the communists tried to win over the people. They became masters of modern propaganda. From the wagons of special agitprop trains, party workers acted out political dramas. On the trains, many Russians saw movies for the first time with an optimistic message about the future. Posters put across the central ideas of communism, as conceived by the 19th century German Karl Marx and adapted by Lenin. At the heart was the idea of class struggle. In the past, the capitalists had exploited the downtrodden workers. Now, the proletariat was to take control. In the factories, workers' representatives would make the decisions. The idea of profit would be abandoned. The fruits of their labor would be hospitals, housing, and schools. And it would be for Communist Party members, the true believers, to lead the way to this radiant future. Mikhail Minlin was working in a Moscow factory. We didn't need special words. We weren't going to discuss the theory of building communism. Setting a personal example, we considered this the most important thing in all our work, in the Komsomol and in the factories. So people would say, look, that must be a communist. Why? Well, look how he's working. Russia's peasants, 80% of the population, were the least well-off in the new society. Thanks to the revolution, many now farmed land taken from the landowners. But their living standards were well behind the rest of Europe. Few were literate, but in 1920, the new government decreed that all Soviet citizens were to be taught to read. Teams of young activists were sent to the country. We went from house to house in search of illiterate people. We made a note of their names. We then found suitable rooms to hold classes in. Learning to write would open new doors for those trapped at the bottom of society. One woman who couldn't attend classes because of her child at home was helped by Anastasia Denisova. I said, here's a textbook for you. I'll come to you so you can learn to read at home. I remember vividly that when the baby cried, she carried on writing with one hand while she rocked him with the other. She was so keen to study. I'll always remember her striving for knowledge and enlightenment. It was immense. To produce engineers and technicians for the new society, training was expanded. And the communists said women should have equality with men, with equal pay. Ella Shishtia was one of a new generation of women. When Lenin said that communism is Soviet power plus electrification, I decided that I should become an electrical engineer, that that was my holy duty. And I didn't want to just draw up plans. I wanted to build an electric power station. That was my mission, and I achieved it. The revolution gave me the right to feel equal to any man. It gave me the right to work, to study what I wanted to study. The 1920s saw an explosion of new thinking in every field. 
Architects designed public buildings that broke with bourgeois styles. And musicians experimented too. Izo Dekja was part of a bold experiment that took the idea of equality to new heights. He played in a special Moscow orchestra in which the musicians were so equal that no conductor was needed. To achieve this solidarity and harmony, the musicians sat facing one another. Life was very hard for musicians at the beginning of the revolution. The conductors didn't treat them well at all. But the founder of the orchestra said that it was the musician who mattered and that he should liberate himself from the fetters of the conductor. In the first symphony orchestra without an oppressive leader, musical decisions were made collectively. If you didn't like something, you all had a vote. For instance, if you couldn't hear the clarinets, you told them the truth. You're behind. You're not coming in on time. Or you have to play this bit like this. Who's in favor? Who's against? This wouldn't happen in an orchestra with a conductor. It was a real innovation. But despite all the talk about equality, the Russian masses did have a conductor who directed everything, and it was Lenin. By the time he died, he had created a one-party, one-ideology state and an elaborate system of control. But Lenin had not achieved all the goals of communism. His successor, Joseph Stalin, inherited a society in which much of the old Russia survived. Large sectors of the economy were still in private hands. Peasants were still able to sell the produce they farmed in the markets. But Stalin was determined to make the state the sole economic power. He launched the first five-year plan to centralize and modernize the economy. It was a call for mobilization to create the heavy industries the Soviet Union needed to defend itself in a hostile world. Construction worker Tatyana Fyodorova was held up as an example to others. We live so well. Our hearts are so joyful. In no other country are there such happy young people as us. We're the happiest young people. And on behalf of all young people, I want to thank our party and our dear comrade Stalin for this joy that we have. Stalin set a task, build this or build that. And thanks to the fact that people trusted him and this enthusiasm of young people, it was possible. Remember, this was a country where people were illiterate, lived in virtual darkness, 
wore birch bark shoes. Even now, I think it's like something out of a fairy tale. How is it possible, at one of the most difficult times, to raise these great construction sites? It was only possible through the unity of the people and the love of the people for their idol. Because for us, Stalin was an idol. With so much to build so quickly, workers were sent all over the country. Tens of thousands went beyond the Ural Mountains deep into Asia to start construction of a giant new steelworks. They saw themselves as pioneers. For Valentina Mikova and Mikhail Akipov, these were the most fulfilling days of their lives. There was one excavator at the last furnace building site, and it wasn't always reliable. So we dug all the foundations by hand. The trench would be teeming with people. One takes the earth, throws it to the level above. The second person throws it to the third, the third to the fourth, up to five or six levels. That was how we got the earth out of the trench. Then it was taken away in wheelbarrows. Magnitogorsk was modeled on a plant in Gary, Indiana. Among the workers were thousands of forced laborers, and all lived in terrible conditions. The beds were in one large room, shared by up to 200 people, often whole families together. There were wooden lavatories outside and a communal kitchen. Water was rationed, and we had to get that outside as well. I think that we, the first construction workers of Magnitogorsk, were united by the difficulties we all faced. We were already schooled in our Soviet traditions. We felt the whole economy was ours, that we were the bosses, that we were working for ourselves. The first of construction and spending in the Soviet Union came during the Great Depression in the West. Many of the jobless liked what they heard about communism. It sounded like a worker's paradise. I became a communist in short because of what I saw around me here in the United States of America. There was misery, there were children going to bed hungry, there was poverty, and there was no reason for it. We were the richest country in the world, and I saw communists out on the streets demonstrating and trying to do something about it. And that's, that would sum up why I joined the Communist Party. Well, I, I believe what was going on in the Soviet Union was a noble experiment. You stop and think for a moment of what, what is the aim of socialism? It's to end all exploitation. It's to put an end to wars. It's to build a system of cooperation instead of confrontation. It's to do away with the extremely rich on one side and the extremely poor on the other side. The Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw toured the Soviet Union visiting factories and farms with Lady Astor. 
Shaw wrote in a hotel guest book, Tomorrow I leave this land of hope and return to our western countries of despair. When he got back, he claimed Russia had been maligned. We have rebuked her ungodliness, and now the sun shines on Russia as on a country with which God is well pleased, whilst his wrath is heavy on us, and we don't know where to turn for comfort or approval. Soviet newsreels showed Stalin as a genial figure, head of the family of nationalities that made up the new worker state. But he was ruthless with anyone who challenged him. He demanded obedience at all levels. The church was a challenge to the communists. For millions of Russians, it was still a source of strength and offered the only alternative system of beliefs. But the communists were atheists and sought to remove the challenge by abolishing the church. Village priests were ridiculed and harassed and forced to renounce their faith. Israel Chernitsky was a communist activist in his village in the Ukraine. Пришел батюшка, снял себя рясло и положил на стул. The priest came in, took off his cassock and put it on the table. They called the barber and he cut off his hair. And the priest announced, there is no God, I have lied to you. The peasant sitting there cried out, how could you? We built you a house, and now you're saying there's no God. The greatest threat to the life of the peasants came when Stalin decided to end private farming. He thought their methods were too inefficient to raise the food the country needed. A campaign was organized against the richer peasants, the so-called kulaks, who were said to be opposing Stalin's plans. Kulak farmers were rounded up. We went into the house, the commission of five or six people, and the secretary of the party organization announced, according to the decision of our meeting, your family is de -kulakized. Put all your valuables on the table. I warn you, no hysterics. I've got strong nerves. We'll stand firm. A woman burst into tears and cursed the authorities. Last... Stalin said the Kulaks should be liquidated as a class. Over three million were shot or died in exile or in the camps. The state seized the peasants' farm implements. And they took over all the land, which was now to be farmed collectively. But the peasants didn't want collectivization. They killed their livestock rather than give them up and the state took the grain. The result was famine. Over five years, seven million died of starvation. These were scenes that Bernard Shaw and other Western visitors did not see. Pelagaya Ovcharenko was almost taken by the body collectors. 
Three people came to the house. One tended the horses. Two were piling up corpses on the cart. They threw on my mother. They threw on my father. My father gestured to me. The man said, he's almost ready, he's almost dead. When my father gestured, I knew I had to go and hide. The men swore. They couldn't find me because I'd crawled away on my hands and knees and hidden myself. The corpses were piled up like bales of straw. The men took the cart to a big hole and tipped the bodies in, regardless of whether they were dead or alive. The terrible price was not mentioned when Stalin listed socialism's achievements in 1937. <laughs> На наших полях работают труженики земли, без помещиков, без кулаков. Руководят этими работами люди из народа. Это и называется у нас социализмом быту. It was said Stalin's ovations were so long because no one dared to be seen as the first to stop clapping. For Stalin was not just using harsh methods to push through changes he thought were essential. He was obsessed with destroying all potential opponents. Stalin, the leader of the first worker's state, lived in reclusive comfort. And he felt insecure as to him. One by one, the most senior communists who had transformation became his victims. Nikolai Bukharp stalled into power, but then dared to criticize him. At first, Bukharin was isolated in his Kremlin flat with his young wife. He remained a loyal communist, even when the moment of arrest came. It was terrifying, tragic. He literally fell down on his knees before me and asked forgiveness for ruining my life. He said that if he could ever have imagined that his life would end this way, he would have run as far as possible away from me. No matter how strong his love, he would have suppressed it. He asked me never to forget his letter, which is now called his testament, and without fail to bring up his son, a Bolshevik. That's the kind of faith he had, a Bolshevik to the end. Bukharin's fate was sealed at one of a series of show trials, specially designed as propaganda events to create fear and instill obedience. The trials were a concoction of fake evidence and false accusations. So-called confessions were forced through torture and threats to the victims' families. Officials and journalists in the courtroom played their part in the drama. 
Boris Yefimov, who attended Bukharin's trial as a newspaper cartoonist, says he believed the confession he heard was genuine. How could I doubt it if with my own ears I heard Bukharin describe himself as an enemy? How he had planned to overthrow Soviet power, to hand over the Ukraine to the Germans, how he told of his betrayal. What would you have said in my place if you'd heard a man confess his crime to your own ears? It was a kind of hypnosis. In his cartoons for Pravda, Yufimov obediently took up the prosecutor's description of the accused as vile dogs. Это была у него какая-то фраза о том, что вот Троцкий и Бухарин это вот. He used this phrase that Trotsky and Bukharin were one creature, a two-headed creature, the mad dog of fascism. Две головы, но они в общем это одно и то же. Это. It's an example of satire serving propaganda. Фашизма. Every simple, I won't say fool, but every simple person could understand it. Yefimov applauded when the death penalty was pronounced. When they read out his death sentence, something snapped inside me. I felt that I'd changed, that the lights over our wonderful Soviet Union were extinguished. Stalin's morbid paranoia grew. No one at any level, whether they were in the park. From his desk, the great terror was controlled and conducted. Secret police orders gave every region an arbitrary quota for the purges. Category one meant death. Category two meant the prison camps. But at times Stalin grew impatient when he scribbled give a supplementary quota of 6,000 people in the first category to Krasnodar. He was signing the death warrant for an extra 6,000 people. The purges struck many of the earliest enthusiasts for communism. Mikhail Mindlin in category two was arrested and interrogated by the secret police in Moscow. When the interrogation began, I was asked to sign lies about myself and good comrades from my region. They had to be a list of 47 people. They wanted to get me to sign a statement. I wouldn't. They kept me standing for five days, day and night. My legs were so swollen. At the height of the purges, ordinary people had to take part in mass demonstrations against so-called enemies of the people. Yet some who had been most devoted to what was going on. The young electrical engineer couldn't believe what her husband, a party official, told her. He understood. He knew what I didn't know. When he said, you can't imagine it, Stalin is shooting all the present members of the Politburo, and he counted them off one by one. I couldn't bear it. 
We were having lunch. I picked up a knife and threw it at him. Thank goodness I missed him, but that was what was happening at the time. Stalin was shooting them all. She broke with her first husband over this incident. Later he was purged and killed. She soon married another man, one who shared her unquestioning adoration for Stalin. But he too was purged. Then as the wife of an enemy of the people, Ella Shishchia was herself arrested and sentenced to prison in Siberia. She was sent with a party of other women crammed into boxcars. With nothing but salted fish to eat, she developed a desperate thirst. I remember when there was a hard frost. Inside the wooden cattle truck, I used to lick the ice off the metal screws and bolts, fearing only that my tongue would stick. That's how we traveled for about a month. Their husbands had been killed before they left Moscow, but the women were convinced they were in the boxcar just behind them. As the train went east, they sang a song hoping their men would hear. Это мы, ваши жены, подруги, Это мы ваш, нашу песню поем Из Москвы по сибирской дороге Вместе с вами этапом идем Прочитали в бутырках нам приговор Дали каждой жене восемь лет И вручив шиковою пакеты Повезли нас по сто человек. Было тяжко в холодной теплушке, Ели только мы рыбный кондер. У конвоя выпрашивали свечку, Не теряя былой свой загон. Prisoners became an essential part of the workforce, slave labor for the new mines and railways. First I worked on the BAM railway, then in Kolyma. The important thing was not to die of hunger. They gave you balanda, a soup with just a few fish bones and some oats floating around. We drank from metal bowls. They gave us a ladle of balanda and a lump of bread. We could hardly work for the cold. If we didn't move or work, we would have frozen. When someone wanted to relieve themselves, they had to take their mittens off. By the time they undid their trousers, their hands were frozen. As soon as they pulled it out, it froze. Many people had their parts amputated. There were no injections or anything to reduce pain. They didn't even have proper scalpels. When I was in the camp, they asked me to hold out my frostbitten foot, and with pliers, they just took chunks out. That was the treatment, the operation. It was considered that if you survived the first winter, you'd get through your sentence. Most people didn't survive. 
большинство не выдерживало. Сталин's henchmen tried to justify what was happening. Applauding the message was the loyal construction worker, Tatyana Fyodorov. А то, что какие-то вот такие политические интриги, игры, которые были, если будут, к сожалению. The fact is that unfortunately you always have political intrigues, machinations of this kind. Не заслонило движение вперед никак. It was a very hard time, but it didn't derail the movement forward in any way, because the country was growing at great speed. We're talking about a country of many millions. The whole population worked, sang songs. It doesn't mean that everything was extinguished, everything was lost. The state film studios tried to beguile Soviet audiences into thinking these were normal times, producing escapist musicals in the style of Hollywood. On the surface, for those that had not devoured, the great communist experiment could claim to have achieved many of its goals by the end of the 1930s. The vast majority were able to read. Great construction projects like the Moscow subway had been completed. And many Soviet citizens had opportunities for work they'd never had before. After working as a village teacher in her youth, Anastasia Denisova had moved to the city. The revolution opened my eyes to the world. It gave me everything. I was wearing birch bark sandals when I came to Moscow to study. I didn't reach any great heights after studying, but my eyes were opened. In 1917, the communists had been a small minority. They'd imposed their ideas on their fellow countrymen, hoping to persuade them with the results. But 20 years later, even the early believers knew the promise that the oppressed masses will themselves form the government had not been delivered. We knew that it was the most important of socialism. He was the greatest enemy of socialism. He had damaged socialism by destroying people in all parts of life, in agriculture, the arts, the military, and the party. He destroyed people everywhere. Wasn't that evil against those great goals we had in mind? Цели, о которой мы все время говорим. In the second half of the 1930s alone, over seven million people were executed, and an estimated seven million more sent to the camps. There was no socialism of any kind under Stalin. 
Stalin himself destroyed all socialism. If it hadn't been Stalin, it would have been someone else. Someone would have destroyed this system because, probably, the time had not yet come for such a society. In the camps, ordinary men and women toiled and died. Victims of a political system whose lofty rhetoric and utopian promises had become twisted into a nightmare. But far from dying, communism would continue to grow to become one of the most powerful forces of the 20th century dominating the lives of millions and bringing with it the same popular hopes and the same vicious realities. <laughs>